Welcome to the IBM Podcast Network. I had a strange dream the other night. I dreamed that there was a vacancy in the online magazine I edit, Pragati, at thinkpragati.com, and I needed to fill that post. Now, in this actual world, I don't have a vacancy right now, but in the dream I did. So I called up a talented young journalist I knew, told her about the job profile and the salary, and asked her if she would like to come on board. She was gurgling with excitement as she said, Yes, yes, of course I would. The job profile is perfect. The salary is perfect. And most of all, I will have the chance to soak up the life lessons that you impart in your sonorous voice. But there is one problem. What problem? I asked. I can solve any problem. I am half Bengali. She said, Here's the problem. I already have a contract with my existing employer. You'll have to buy me out of that contract with a hefty transfer fee. This took me aback. I barked at her. Transfer fee? What transfer fee? This is journalism, not football. Welcome to The Seen and the Unseen, our weekly podcast on economics, politics, and behavioral science. Please welcome your host, Amit Varma. Welcome to The Seen and the Unseen. The English Premier League summer transfer deadline comes up in three days from now, on the 31st of August. In today's episode, I will try and demystify what exactly goes on in that mysterious transfer market. How do football contracts work? How do those transfer fees work? And why are they so crazy? Sometimes insanely high and sometimes zero for players who should be worth something. The guest I have on this show today to shed light on this is Karthik Shashidhar. Karthik is an old friend of mine from a decade and a half ago when blogging hadn't yet been killed by social media. He was always the smartest geek in the room. Sort of like Freakonomics personified. Well, after many years of nagging by friends, Karthik has finally written a book. Between the Buyer and the Seller is published by the Takshashila Institution, which also publishes Pragati, and will be released on September 8th. You can pre-order it now on Amazon.in. Karthik's book deals with the nature of markets, and one of his early chapters is about football. So without much further ado, let's kick off the show. Karthik, welcome to the show. Thanks, Amit. Karthik, I really enjoyed your book. It was an easy read, just like a storybook. But at the same time, at the end of it, I just felt much smarter for having read it. So thank you for writing it. Well, thanks for the comment. Um, one of the things that kind of struck me is one of your early chapters deals with a subject that's really in the news these days, football transfers. I mean, everyone's talking about Neymar's big uh, 200 million euro plus transfer to PSG from Barcelona and so on. And uh, you talk about uh, the football transfers markets and why they are, uh, you know, some of the prices seem absolutely crazy, both on the high side and sometimes on the low side, where a seemingly good player can't get anything absolutely. The value seems to drop to zero. Uh, but before we actually get into the meat of why that is so, uh, as someone who follows football only occasionally, I want to ask some really newbie questions for you to demystify this whole thing, like how transfers work and so on. So how does the football market really work? Like when one club buys another player, you know, pays a transfer fee for say 100 million or whatever, what are they really buying and how does all of this work? Who does a player have contracts with and so on? So the way it works is typically a player enters into a contract with a club. So, uh, so the, and then like uh, what happens in the transfer market is that the buying club essentially pays off the selling club to release the player's contract. So, PL, so uh, Neymar had a contract with Barcelona, which was supposed to last and uh, for another two three years, I think. Uh, and uh, what PSG did by paying the 200 odd million euros is to uh, tell Barcelona, okay, here's all this money. I know that Neymar is legally contracted to play for you for the next two, three years, but take this money so that you can break off the contract. This is compensation for you for the services Neymar is not going to provide you for the next few years. And once you have released Neymar, then we are going to sign him. And so basic- and strike a similar contract. Right. So basically, then the buying club, which is PSG in this case, has to negotiate with two parties. One, they have to negotiate with Barcelona, which might often be a matter of simply meeting the clause in the contract, which says that this is the exit fee. And they have to also negotiate with Neymar uh, in terms of what the salary that they pay him, which in his case, I think is more than 600, 700 euros a week or whatever. Uh, so that he agrees because his consent is also required, right? Absolutely. Uh, and there have been several cases in the past when 
transfers have not gone through for both these reasons. I mean, uh, you have cases where you manage to agree a fee with the selling club, but you can't agree what the football journalists call as personal terms with the players. Uh, basically, like uh, the player, you can't agree on a particular uh, salary, and it can also happen that like a uh, player is particularly happy to play for you, and you have agreed a salary, but the club is not willing to sell for whatever uh, p- price. So yes, it is a kind of a d- double deal that you need to do. You need to deal both with the selling club and with the player. So now, before we get to the meat of the episode, there is one question which struck me recently, which I can't figure out, and it will probably seem like ridiculously basic to you. So just bear with me. Uh, so recently, you know, uh, one got to read that okay, Alexis Sanchez has a year left on his contract. Mesut Ozil has a year left on his contract. Now the question is that whichever club would buy them would essentially be paying two tranches of money. One would be the monthly salary to the player itself, which would come to X million a year. And the other would be a big transfer fee, which would which would be 60 million, 100 million, whatever, in the case of these two players, quite a lot. So the question is, instead of selling off now and uh, letting the club get the transfer fee, why don't they just wait for a year and just take the full amount themselves when they are free agents? Uh, so I think it's not uh, entirely kind of... Uh, uh, in their hands as well. So, uh, see, from Arsenal's perspective, Arsenal is the team that both Mesut Ozil and Alexis Sanchez are contacted to right now. From Arsenal's perspective, they would rather want to sell them now when they can still get some value out of the transfer. Or, I mean, 25 years back, there was this ruling that has come to be known as the um, uh, Bosman ruling, which basically says that if a player has... Less than six months on his contract, he's free to uh, talk to any new club and uh, arrange his own transfer. So if Arsenal doesn't manage to sell these guys now, what will happen is they might have to let go of them for a very low number. So what they are likely to do is that they'll either arrange a deal right now or they'll sign new contracts with these guys and extend their playing careers so that next year, if they have to sell them, they can at least get uh, a good fee and, and so on. But since the consent of the player is also required, doesn't it make more sense for the player to just wait till he's a free agent and take all the money? That is, uh, you know, what not just what their fee would be as a uh, player as a weekly fee, but also what would otherwise be the transfer money which the buying club is clearly willing to play but will now have to give the player. Yes, I mean, a player can uh, can technically do that, but then what can happen is he can uh, get frozen out by the club. So, let's say if you are agitating too much either to get a transfer or to not get a transfer and you end up pissing off your club, remember that the, your current club is still your current employer. Right. And your manager might decide to not play you for the next one year, mm. the, uh, after which your market value will go down will erode if you haven't you. been playing. And so, uh, and uh, because of that, like players usually don't try to take such risks. And also, remember, it's a very small market, small number of players, small number of clubs uh, at their very elite level. So there, there are there can be enough people who in the market who can be uh, irrational enough uh, for uh, things like uh, this to not work and so on. Right. So now let's get to the meat of the subject. Your book is called Between the Buyer and the Seller and it's essentially about markets and how changes in the amount of liquidity in the market can make them behave in different ways. So can you explain the central concept for me? Like what is a liquid market and, uh, you know, how would the football market qualify and what are sort of the effects of the football market not being very liquid? Okay. Uh, so the word liquidity, uh, uh, I must start off saying that it, it has no particular precise definition. I mean, it's a very overloaded term. It's used in several different contexts. If you hear an accountant talking about it, it means one thing. If you hear a monetary economist talking about it, it means yet another thing. If you hear a market guy talking about it, it means a third thing. A financial market guy talking about it, it means something completely different and so on. So it's a very overloaded term. So because of which people get a little thrown off by the term. But to put it very simply, liquidity is the ease with which you can buy or sell a particular asset. So, uh, so in this particular case, so if you think about it, if you were wanted uh, to buy a hundred shares of Infosys tomorrow, all you need to do is to log, log on to your brokerage account or to call your broker and say you wanted to buy that. And the number of shares of Infosys traded on the Bombay Stock Exchange every day is so huge that like you can get your 100 shares at at the uh, best price, at price that is like very close to what the prevailing market price is then. So in that sense, the Infosys stock is a very liquid stock. 
on the other hand if you were to let's say if you wanted to buy a stake in uber uber is not a publicly traded company so if you have to kind of uh, uh, buy some shares in that then you you can't just go to a central exchange to uh, where the millions of shares change hands every day and so on you have to call up one of the few uh, people who hold the stock right now convince them that they need to sell it to you uh, go through a protracted dance of kind of uh, uh, figuring out the price and so on so the amount of effort that's involved in conducting the deal in order to buy or sell shares in uber which is not listed is immense so in that sense it's a very illiquid stock so uh, so liquidity is basically a measure of uh, uh, how easy or difficult it is to uh, trade in a p- particular uh, thing or a commodity and uh, let me just um, i'm just trying to um, pull out a quote from my uh, book which which is what i start the book with uh, and i think it's worth quoting here this is by michael lewis in his book flash boys which is about high frequency trading and in financial markets he says liquidity was one of those words wall street people threw around when they wanted the conversation to end and for <laughs> brains to go dead and for all questioning to cease and it's partly because it means so many things but in your definition a liquid market is one in which trades happen very easily uh, without any friction and low transaction costs and a great example of this is obviously like you said a computerized stock exchange where the you know it's very easy for buyers and sellers to find themselves there's no cost to that and also because there are so many buyers and so many sellers uh, you could say that whatever each thing is priced at is an accurate reflection of supply and demand and an illiquid market is one where either is very hard for buyers and sellers to find themselves or there are very few buyers and sellers like in the case of if you want to buy uber stock you have to call one of the individuals or um, uh, institutional investors who actually own some and negotiate with them one on one and that is illiquid and in markets like that prices are kind of out of whack exactly so what is the football market like so football market i think is like uh, at the very elite level it's fairly illiquid uh, basically and it it's illiquid for a number of reasons the first thing is that like i mean the it's very hard to kind of uh, there are a few reasons for that first thing is that it's very hard to uh, uh, classify players i mean you have four basic uh, classifications goalkeeper defender midfielder forward but even within that there's so many sub classifications that it's hard for you to find good substitutes for footballers so if you were to kind of lose a particular player let's say barcelona has just lost neymar it's very hard for them to find a comparable player or on the, if psg were to look at barcelona selling neymar and somebody else trying to sell a similar footballer and negotiate between them it would have been very hard for them to do that because you don't find another footballer like neymar and the more elite you go the harder it is to find um, the players who are similar to these players and so on so that's one thing second thing is that i mean it's a very small market very small number of buyers and sellers so even if you manage to kind of uh, pin down a, a particular class of player of whom there are there are quite a few the number of clubs with whom you can kind of negotiate is like uh, uh, really small uh, so that makes it a little harder to transact the other thing is what we spoke about in the beginning of the podcast basically uh, because you have to strike a deal you have to strike two deals you have to strike a deal with both the selling club and with the player so that creates a further complication as well so sometimes the deals can uh, kind of uh, fall through because of that and fourthly you have like some traditional rivalries where like certain clubs blanketly refuse to sell players to certain other clubs i mean it uh, there's absolutely no good reason to do that so that's yet another reason and then so 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 it's like a it's a fairly small and uh, a bit of a national market which makes it like uh, extremely liquid no and circumstances keep changing all the time for example barcelona having sold neymar because he he wanted to go and plc met the price is now desperate to find replacements and at the time of recording this uh, on the 20th of um, august we'll release this episode on the 28th at the time of recording this they've only managed to get paulino from china and he's not a like for like replacement at all in fact he doesn't even seem to fit in the barcelona system of playing and it is likely that at 40 million euros they overpaid for him and what is now likely till the transfer windows ends on august 31st is that whoever they buy they will overpay for him because they are desperate to fill the neymar size gap somehow and other clubs will take advantage of this 
Oh, absolutely. Uh, so, other news from yesterday is that Barcelona has put out a bid for a hundred and twenty odd million euros to buy this guy called Philip Coutinho from Liverpool Football Club. Now, Coutinho is an excellent player, but he is not Neymar. As in, like they don't play in the same role. Barcelona might have to change the system that they have been playing over the last three years in order to fit in Coutinho rather than Neymar. And and on the other side, Liverpool got a bid for 120 million euros, which is a huge sum of money, and they rejected it, saying we are not a selling club. Basically, you also have this posturing because you don't want to give out the optics that like you yeah. if you sell good players, it seems like you are not a great club and so on. So so you have these uh, uh, things that go on as well. So so yeah, so Barcelona can't replace Neymar. They might just get Coutinho, but they, I'm, I'm sure they're going to uh, end up uh, overpaying for it, and that's uh, probably what Liverpool is holding out for. And and uh, you know, Coutinho is not like an Infosys share that if one guy refuses to sell, you buy it from someone else. He's unique, and they want him desperately. And the smartest thing for Liverpool would be just to play chicken and hold out until the very end when they get some really insane number, which Coutinho would otherwise not have got. And this is the deal that they turned down. I think, if I'm not mistaken, is already the highest ever transfer price offered to Liverpool to sell one of their players. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's just it's just about higher than what uh, Barcelona had offered Liverpool for Luis Suarez. Uh, I think cut uh, three years back, and uh, uh, so uh, it is the highest uh, price that has been offered. And uh, there's still like uh, uh, at the time we uh, are recording this, eleven days left to go in the transfer window. So I think there's a good chance Barcelona might come out come out with an even higher price, and like Liverpool knows that and. So the, what happens in the, in an illiquid market basically is that the price gets set based on party who is more desperate to do the deal. So in this particular case, Liverpool doesn't really want to let go of Coutinho. He's a he's been a great player. He's scored the most goals for them last season, and they really want to keep him. But they know that one Coutinho wants to go to Barcelona, and two that Barcelona is willing to pay a good price for him. So they are just going to hold out until they know that Barcelona is not going to pay an even higher price, at which case the deal will be done. Right. So what we see here is that it's a highly illiquid market and therefore because of that, because of these dynamics, very few buyers, very few sellers, all these circumstantial uh, factors playing a part, that sometimes a lot of players get paid crazy amounts which you would not imagine they're worth and sometimes it's the opposite uh, uh, where uh, they seem to get absolutely nothing and nobody wants them, though even that surely can't be the case. And you've described this very well in your chapter and I'd urge people to read your book. But if I were to now ask you that, let's say that you have to play God and you have to design the football market in an optimal way so that it's best for both buyers and sellers, or it can lead to better outcomes for buyers and sellers, what would you change? Okay, that's a really hard question. I mean, like, uh, there have been a few proposals on uh, kind of changing the football market because, like, I mean, obviously what happens is, like, when you have these insane amounts being thrown around for uh, purchasing people's contracts, you have people who say that, okay, this is not a great market, we need to reform it. And people talk about, let's say, the U.S. market, where, it is, by the way, the school, sports in the U.S. works very differently from the way it works in Europe because there it's a, in the U.S., it's a top-down structure where the, uh, where the league recruits the uh, teams and so like uh, kind of the league has control of who kind of sells to whom and so on. Uh, on the other hand, in Europe, it's the teams who own the league. So it's a very different structure. But in the US, uh, you don't have the concept of a transfer fee. You can only like, in, in most sports, you can only like swap players uh, or like just bring a contract to an end and so on. So what they have tried to do is to remove price from the negotiation. But what happens is that if you remove monetary price from negotiation, the price will find itself into the deal in other ways. And it just makes it even harder to kind of buy and sell. So that's obviously not a... So, so, uh, so you know, I'll, I'll take this opportunity and ask you to demystify that a little bit as well. So what do you mean that, you know, uh, if price doesn't play a part, how do these things get decided? And in what other ways does that value manifest itself? Yeah, so uh, now, now just imagine that, like, uh, for example, uh, 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 the PSG wasn't allowed to say, give a, a single euro to Barcelona in order to buy Neymar. And but you know that like Neymar desperately wants to uh, play for PSG, uh, but, but he has uh, a certain number of years left on his Barcelona contract, and Barcelona like him, and they don't want to let go of him. 
so uh, so they can't like uh, so how do you kind of resolve this uh, case so what price allows in this particular case is an elegant solution where psg basically gives this money to basman and say okay here's some good money to compensate for you you not getting your services for next two years please break your contract and basman will thank you we are very happy with the money you are offering us we are going to break the contract if you don't have a price you can arrange for some swaps uh, that that's what they do in the us but then what will happen is like you can't have a like for like swap so if you were to look at it from the price perspective in order to uh, kind of compensate for uh, neymar you would have to kind of uh, uh, have psg might have to sell their entire rest of their team <laughs> in order to compensate for neymar so we just think obviously not a kind of a, a good thing to do so in that sense uh, uh, you would uh, what neymar might just end up continuing for barcelona he will be unhappy barcelona will be unhappy uh, both of them he might get less money from psg whenever he manages to move to them psg is not happy all parties are left significantly worse off than they are now when you have a transparent price mechanism irrespective of how irrational it is it's always good that like things are settled with uh, money rather than through so with the transparent price system basically what it does is that it makes the market more liquid and makes outcomes better for both buyers and sellers Uh, yes it makes outcomes better for both buyers and sellers for for sure and i don't know i don't know how i would redesign this market i mean like uh, and the other thing i mean I, again i mentioned this in the book the other thing is with football markets is that like i mean there's no good way to place a valuation on a football player if you are think of something like an uber stock right it's again highly illiquid very few buyers and sellers but at least like you have some models in literature on how do you value a company how do you value a, a private company whose financial details you don't know and all that there's still some uh, theoretical backing to that so because of which the price that a buyer will be willing to pay and the price that a, a seller will want is not going to be that much far off but here because like football is a team game and it's very hard to kind of place a value on a particular player at any point in time what happens is that like i mean the uh, to use financial terminology the bid and the ask prices the uh, price that the buyer is willing to pay and the price that the seller wants uh, start off by being so far off that like it's a it, it ends up being far more uh, irrational and you know is possibly to avoid that kind of irrationality that you know for example the ipl in india has this cap on how much a team can spend during each auctions but despite that you have circumstantial factors playing a big role for example whether you're a player who's set up early in the auction or right at the end of the auction can make a big difference if you're an all rounder early in the auction you may not get so much but if you come later in the auction when two or three teams are really desperate because they haven't filled that slot they might be willing to pay more conversely teams might have less money left at the end of the auction having already done the big spending so all these sort of factors of luck also play a part and uh, somehow and that affects the liquidity in your definition of the market and in arriving at what uh, a good price for a player otherwise would be oh yes and also ipl i think it's like i mean because it's centrally controlled like the us more exclusively modeled on us sports it's not a great market i mean uh, say for example somebody like r ashwin Uh, over the last couple of uh, seasons i think he was contracted to play for the rising pune uh, super giants and uh, he didn't really get to play for them he, i think last season he didn't get to play much and this season again i don't think he uh, played too much if i'm uh, i haven't been following that oh, what i what i heard on the grape wine about last season apparently was that he wanted to be captain and he wasn't given the captaincy so it, he was basically sulking but that's just a pure conjecture it might not be true uh, it might be <laughs> but what happens in a football context is that if you are sulking the team knows that like you are not adding any value they are like okay i can get value for you by putting you out in the market because there are other teams that want you more than i want you so just i'm i'm just going to sell you yeah and in the ipl case because it's all centrally controlled you can't sell buy and sell players you only every kind of transfer has to be approved by the league and like it's, it's just too messy it's just too centrally controlled for the market to uh, and so the outcome wasn't good for ashwin the outcome, because like he wasn't playing the outcome wasn't good for uh, rising pune super giants because like they had to uh, pay this guy his salary as a fairly hefty salary and weren't getting any value out of it and the outcome wasn't great for any of the other clubs because like they could have uh, uh, very well used the services uh, and they were not allowed to do that exactly it's a lose lose situation all around so the greater the liquidity the more the positive sumness of markets actually kicks in and it's a win win outcome for everyone yep 
absolutely uh karthik it's been a pleasure talking to you and and you know one of the two big questions about football about how these markets work has been completely resolved uh, in my mind so thank you for shedding light on that the other big question is of course why so many indians are fanatic supporters of manchester united or liverpool or places they've never been that is inexplicable but is beyond the scope of our discussion and we'll handle that some other time you will come but i can tell you why i am a big fanatic supporter tell of me. liverpool though i have never been to liverpool tell me tell me so so this was back in 2005 i was on a tube train in uh, uh, london and this was the day when liverpool was playing chelsea in a champions league uh, semi final and the train halfway through my journey the train got invaded by a massive bunch of liverpool fans who were on their way to watch the game and they were like a big bunch of rowdy fans getting drunk singing and it was a fantastic experience so it was almost like a religious experience and i got converted through the 10 minute train journey you ended up joining that particular tribe well good luck to you and yes. good luck to liverpool uh, this season um, thanks a lot for coming on the show you're welcome thank you If you enjoyed this episode, do buy Between the Buyer and the Seller, Karthik's book which releases on the 8th of September. You can pre-order it on Amazon now. You can follow Karthik on Twitter at Karthik S K A R T H I K S. You can follow me at Amit Verma A M I T V A R M A. The archives of the Seen and the Unseen are available at seenunseen.in. Do subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher or any podcast app of your choice. See you next week. If you enjoyed listening to the scene and the unseen check out another hit show from Indus Fox Media Networks Cyrus Says which is hosted by my old colleague from MTV Cyrus Brocha you can download it on any podcasting network Good evening ladies and gentlemen this is your captain speaking sorry to say but there's been a slight delay due to the apocalypse having suddenly begun as you can see there's death destruction and chaos taking place all around us But don't you worry food and drinks will be served shortly and I would recommend checking out IVM podcasts to get some of your favorite Indian podcasts we'll keep you going till this whole thing blows over thank you